Good afternoon, good evening, and good morning, depending on when you're joining this webinar. Welcome to LMU's special lecture series on international business and regional studies. My name is Yong Sun Pak. I'm a professor of international business and management and director of the Center for Asian Business and also the Center for International Business Education of Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles. This program is funded by DK Kim Foundation, a gracious benefactor of the Center for Asian Business for the past four years and sponsored by the LMU Center for International Business Education. The Center for Asian Business was established in 1995 to promote better understanding between the US and Asian countries through multiple channels, including international business courses, faculty research grants, student scholarships, special lectures, and movie screenings. LMU is also among the 15 schools in the country who received the, one of the most prestigious Cyber Grants Award from the US Department of Education. The LMU side serves as regional as well as national resources to students, faculty, and business practitioners through international business and area study education, foreign language training, and research capacities. Today, we have a great program for you. Although we have covered similar topics related to denuclearization of Korean Peninsula in the past, it was discussed in a much broader context as part of geopolitical issues in Northeast Asia. As you well know, during the Trump administration, there was a lot of hype surrounding the Trump-Kim Kim Jong-un summit, hoping for a much improved relationship between South and North Korea, as well as the US and North Korea, by making some tangible progress toward denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. However, since the Hanoi summit ended in failure in February 2019, a dialogue with North Korea has, has been literally suspended for more than two years. Now with the launch of the Biden administration, there's a still small hope to resume a dialogue with North Korea, but with a new and more creative approach. In fact, South Korean President Moon urged the US government to engage with North Korea as, as soon as possible in his recent interview with New York Times. We are very fortunate today to have one of the most prominent experts on this issue, Dr. Victor Cha. He will be introduced shortly by Professor Thomas Plate, who will serve as moderator for today's program. Before we start the program, I'd like to ask Dr. Dale Smith, the Dean of College of Business Administration to say a few words to welcome everyone, Dr. Smith. Thank you, Professor Peck, and good evening, everyone. On behalf of the College of Business Administration at LMU, we are pleased to welcome you all to another key event from our Center for International Business and Education. As Professor Peck suggested, you're going to hear from a very distinguished speaker tonight, but before that introduction, I'd just like to make a couple of brief comments to set the stage on why these kinds of events are so mission critical to our global community. Earlier this morning, I had the opportunity to participate in a discussion around global responsibility. As a member of the Globally Responsible Leadership Initiative, deans, directors, and business executives around the world get together periodically to talk about how we scale change and make real progress on the planet, impacting sustainable development goals and building a stronger and more peaceful global community. One of the key takeaways from that discussion this morning was how we create and collaborate in multi-directional ways to build strong relationships across borders. And as we talk about the key issues facing our planet, it is the inspiration and strategies that we'll glean from Dr. Cha tonight that really can make a difference. Making connections and collaborating with partners advances an initiative, no matter where in the world it happens. And if we share what we learn in meaningful ways, we can continue to inspire and ensure best practice and multi-sector engagement. Our center and indeed the college is committed to this idea. And I'm delighted that the talk tonight will focus on strategies around denuclearization in a highly volatile part of the world, a goal that really serves our global community so well. And I imagine that our takeaways tonight will be full of insights on repairing the world and how we take insights to be leaders in challenging environments. So thank you again for uh, honoring us with your presence, Dr. Cha. I look forward to tonight's presentation. Thank you, Dale, for your introduction of the CBA mission and your introduction about Global Village and our responsibility and welcome remarks. Now it is my great pleasure to introduce our moderator for tonight, today's program, 
Professor Thomas Plate. Professor Plate is an LMU's clinical professor and distinguished scholar of Asian and Pacific studies. He's also a veteran columnist focused on Asia and America. As part of LMU's Pathfinding Asia Media International Center, he has developed live interactive seminars with major universities across Asia. Professor Plate is also the author of 13 books, including Confessions of an American Media Man, published in 2007, four volumes in the Giants of Asia series, and three in the Tom Plate on Asia book series. He is currently Vice President of the Pacific Century Institute in Los Angeles. Hi, Tom. Thanks for joining us today as moderator for this special event. Now I'd like to ask you to introduce Dr. Cha, and you may start the dialogue. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. First of all, I think hats off to the Center for Asian Business for getting uh, to the LMU community and beyond someone of uh, this enormous stature. Victor Cha knows what he thinks, he says what he thinks, and he makes all of us think as a result. He is, as they say, a man who needs no introduction. After all, we have Wikipedia. But, uh, <laughs> but I'm going to introduce him anyway, and in my own way. He is an individual voice. Issues such as China, Iran, North Korea, these are hard issues. I'm not sure anyone can claim to have the answer to these issues, but they may have approaches that can make these issues less abrasive and less uh, trending towards war. I recall in my own work as a journalist, the late Warren Christopher, Secretary of State under Bill Clinton, you would say, always say that North Korea would be in the top five of all of the issues that the president had to deal with. Top five was what I remember him saying. Don Gregg, who I think uh, Victor knows, a good friend of, of, of mine and others, uh, we, was so, we used to say that North Korea represented the greatest intelligence failure by the American intelligence community of, of, uh, of, all, of all of its failures by far, because the stakes were so great and we knew so, so little. Uh, the one of my favorite commentators on on Korea was Robert Scalapino, the great scholar and sage at, at Berkeley, and he put it best. It seems to me in a story. The story was about ninety seconds, and uh, I'm going to uh, gamble that you like the story because uh, it makes such an important point. Point, and when I'm done with the story, I will yield the rest of my time to. Victor Cha. <laughs> the story goes that uh, God up there in heaven is bored and he, he goes to his uh, Lieutenant Michael and says, you know, Michael, it's too many meetings and too much. It's just, you know, too many angels and, and clouds and everything. And we, I don't really have lost, I've lost touch with the, the souls of the, the people and we need to, I need to reconnect. Uh, and so I want you to find me the person uh, who yesterday uh, died to come to heaven with the most beautiful soul. And I'm going to uh, honor that person uh, with an interview. That person can interview me and ask me any question. So Michael uh, doesn't want to contradict God. So he says, okay, let me see what I can do. Comes back to God. And it turns out that, that uh, God, I, this little slight complication, there, are, there was a tie. And we have two women who had the most beautiful soul. And one was from North Korea, and you're not gonna believe this, but it's true. The other's from South Korea. In the whole of America, the whole of the world, the woman from North Korea and the woman from South Korea, they tied. So I don't know what you wanna do. So God says, well, you know, I have a lot of time. So uh, I'll talk to them both. So then the next day, the, these two old ladies from North Korea, South Korea, they come up to him and they're in awe because after all, he is God. And, uh, God says, you can each ask me a question. And the ladies look at one and I say, well, well, dear Lord, we, we have the same question. And he says, well, what is the question? He says, well, our question, dear Lord, and the one that we really would like answered, and only you can answer it is, when will North and South Korea be reunited into one nation again, one Korean nation? 
God thought, God said, that's a very good question. Mm -hmm. That's tough. Probably not in my lifetime. <laughs> so with the, that's the scale I think of this problem. Uh, and I think that anyone who has the intellectual courage like Dr. Shah has to come forth with a co very coherent view is to be applauded even if one has different views or slightly different views. It doesn't make any difference as he knows when no one knows everything and we're just plotting our way forward. So Dr. Cha, with the gratitude of LMU and, and me personally, uh, welcome and uh, I'm all ears, I'm listening. Hey, well, thank you. Thank you, Tom. That's a great story. Uh, terrific. Um, uh, it's a pleasure to be here with, with you this evening. Um, uh, greetings to everyone at LMU, uh, College of Business Administration. I want to thank Professor Peck for, uh, for ho having me here, Dean Smith, uh, Marky and Jennifer behind the scenes for all that they've done. Um, and uh, I'm particularly happy to share the stage, the Zoom, the Zoom stage, with my friend Tom, um, who I've known for many years and whose work really, both in the journalism and in the scholarly field on Asia, um, have really been terrific. And, um, and so I'm really happy to see him. Too bad we're not seeing each other in person, of course, um, and I'm not um, at your beautiful campus in sunny LA. At least I hope it's sunny today. Well, it's in the evening now, so, um, uh, but it's great to be with you. Um, so um, I, let, let me begin um, with, a, since Tom started with a story, let me also begin with a story um, <clears throat> that uh, sort of touches on what he just mentioned. And that is um, when I was um, working in the government at the White House on this issue, um, I was sitting in my office and told one day, um, uh, Dr. Cha, uh, you've got to go to North Korea. I'm sitting in my office, you know, in the, at, at the White House, and they're like, you got to go to North Korea. And I said, when? And they said, you know, day after tomorrow. <laughs> so uh, I, I said, okay. I mean, the purpose of the trip was to, well, to make a long story short, I had to go for negotiations. And so I got there uh, and I spent three days there um, you know, doing, doing negotiations both on the return of POW MIA remains from the Korean War uh, and then also the, the ongoing nuclear negotiations. Um, and, um, um, and so I flew in by military air, um, but the, when, we, when we landed in, um, in North Korea, the plane, which is a U.S. military plane, can't stay in North Korea. We have no embassy, we have no base, we have nothing in North Korea. So it literally just dropped me off and left, right? Went to Osan Air Base in South Korea. And I remember they said, uh, when you're done, call us. We'll come and pick you up. And then they took off. And then I realized they never left me a phone number. So I had no way of getting back. <laughs> Um, anyway, so I, we, I did what I had to do. And then they drove me, basically drove me uh, from Pyongyang to the DMZ, and then I crossed the uh, the MDL, the military demarcation line, right where Trump and Kim met. I mean, that same spot. I thought that was where I crossed. You know, many years earlier, but that was where I crossed. And then I took a, a helicopter into Seoul to see the South Korean president because he wanted to know how how things went. And the point of all the story is to tell you is that I spent three days in North Korea, and in you know, and Pyongyang is a big city. Um, and it's, it's old, it kind of reminds you of Seoul in the 1960s and 70s. Um, but then when we drove outside of Pyongyang to the DMZ, I saw what was outside of Pyongyang and it was destitute, right? We passed by Kaesong, which is the second largest city in North Korea. And, you know, there were buildings that had no, no windows, not, o not only no winterization, but no windows. Uh, people live there because you could see tarps up and laundry hanging. Um, and um, you really saw the destitution of North Korea. And then flying so after three days of that, and then flying into Seoul, uh, you know, I was, on, I was on this military helicopter. And as we get closer to Seoul, I see the, this large white sprawl, you know, it's just greenery, right? And then I see this large white sprawling factory complex. 
So I asked my um, control officer, I said, what is that, right? It was in a Blackhawk, so it's very noisy and you're listening. And, um, and she said, oh, that is the Samsung factory, right? Samsung electronics factory, where they make you know, phones and everything else. I was like, oh. And then after that, you start to see the skyline of Seoul. And anybody on this call who's been to Korea or seen pictures knows it's just this incredibly um, uh, um, concentrated skyline of gleaming skyscrapers, you know, glass skyscrapers and buildings and traffic and all that. And the thing that struck me in that very moment as after having spent three days in North Korea was that these are the same people, right? North, these are Koreans by blood. They're the same people. And yet, you know, looking at Kaesong and looking at the skyline of Seoul, they both ended up so differently, right? And this has, there's no other explanation for this other than politics. Right. This is what politics can do to people, to a country, to a society. And so I felt an incredible sense of um, sadness and sorrow at that moment as a political scientist to actually you know, witness how destructive politics can be um, in terms of dividing a country and dividing a people. And I think we all hope that someday that division will, uh, that gap will close and that division will disappear. Um, so I'm here to talk about sort of um, uh, policy and strategy towards North Korea. I have, I have uh, also a bunch of views on South Korea, so I'm happy to talk about that in the question and answer. But given the limited amount of time, um, let, me, let me focus, mostly, um, fo focus uh, mostly on North Korea and the Biden administration's approach to North Korea. Um, as you all know, that there is a policy review underway that has been frequently referred to by members of the administration. I'm not going to pretend to know what's inside of that policy review. It's a secret policy review, obviously, and it's not like they advertise what they're what they're talking about. But I can't. But I can't offer some comments this evening about what I think would be important uh, principles for thinking about how to approach uh, uh, how to approach um, this this particular. Um, perennial, uh, perennial problem um, for U.S. national security and for East Asian, East Asian stability. Um, for, but before I even do that, the first thing I would say is that uh, policy is people and people is policy. And uh, the team that the Biden administration has to deal with this issue, I think, really is a very, very good team, really a, fa a fantastic group of, of people. Um, Kurt Campbell, who was formerly the Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs in the State Department during the Obama administration, author of the so-called Pivot to Asia, you know, is now as, at the White House as the Senior Coordinator for East Asia Policy. And, you know, he's just, I think he's one of the most creative thinkers on U.S. strategy to Asia. Um, I think there are, are a, lot of, a lot of good people and a lot of people who uh, ensure the continuity of policy. But I think what distinguishes Campbell is he looks for change and innovation. Um, and, and I think, um, and I think that's, that's very important at this particular time, given the difficulties and the challenges in the region. Um, there are two folks at the NSC, Edgar Kagan and Laura Rosenberger, um, who are the senior directors um, I know both of, both of them very well. Both of them have a lot of, a lot of experience on, on the North Korea problem. Um, uh, 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 Kagan is actually a China specialist. I mean, he speaks fluent Chinese. Um, but he, again, has a lot of experience with the North Korea issue. When we were doing six-party talks, he was actually the political officer for, in, at the embassy in Beijing. So he, he was what, very much involved in the last agreement in the talks. And then, of course, um, during the Obama administration, he was the Korea desk officer. So that's the highest ranking professional foreign service officer on Korea in the State Department. So he's got a lot of experience there. Laura Rosenberger, who's the senior director for China, even though she's the senior for director for China, she has a lot of experience on North Korea as well. In fact, when we were doing the six party talk, she at that time was the junior most person on the delegation. Um, 
as um, a presidential management fellow actually uh, doing North Korean human rights. Um, and, and since then she's, you know, she's been quite involved. She was working for Secretary Blinken when he was deputy secretary. Um, and so, you know, they're great people um, at the NSC working on this issue. And at the State Department as well, they're terrific people. Wendy Sherman, obviously, the Deputy Secretary just confirmed, has been quite involved in this issue in the past with Secretary Albright. Um, and then Dan Crittenbrink, the new Assistant Secretary for East Asia, once he gets confirmed, also was actually the, um, uh, was also at the embassy in Beijing when we were doing six party talks. So first point is policy is people, people is policy, and they have good people doing this. Um, so what do these people need to think about or what are they thinking about? Um, the first is um, the whole question of what the main objective of US policy when it comes to North Korea should be. Um, and here, um, for those of you who, who know what I've written and said in the past, it should come as no surprise to you that I think the U.S. objective still still needs to remain the complete, verifiable, and irreversible denuclearization of North Korea. Um, 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 during the Trump administration, we saw a lot of discussion about how the two sides did not agree on a definition of denuclearization, that a lot of the Singapore summit, actually the first summit, was about trying to hammer out what a common definition of denuclearization is. Um, but as far as I'm concerned, there is a clear definition of denuclearization. And it's one that the North Koreans agreed to in writing in the six party talks um, in 2005, 2007. Uh, they agreed to this in writing in front of not just the United States, but in front of China, in front of Russia, in front of Japan, and in front of South Korea. And that is that, then the definition is that North Korea will abandon all nuclear weapons and existing nuclear programs, right? That's the definition. They agreed to it in writing. Um, so all this stuff about, well, there isn't a common definition. I don't think that's true. There is a, there is a common definition. That's the first point. Now, the second point is that having said that, 2005 was 16 years ago. And North Korea's program has grown immeasurably since then. Um, it was somewhat under wraps, uh, or, you know, 2005, six, seven, eight. Uh, but really since then, it has just grown by leaps and bounds. North Korea has conducted over 130 ballistic missile tests. Think about that, over 130 ballistic missile tests. In the last year of the Obama administration and the four years of Trump, um, they conducted over 30 ballistic missile tests. And those tests were um, in some cases of long range uh, missiles, but many of them were perfecting and improving short range ballistic missiles. Um, <clears throat> and, um, and, and at the same time, they have amassed who know, they have you know, estimates vary somewhere between 20 and 30 nuclear weapons, um, but they have amassed a lot of fissile material uh, in this interim period, um, probably in the, on the order of, of, of bo both plutonium, weapons grade plutonium and enriched uranium to make two types of nuclear weapons. Um, and they probably have enough for scores more in terms of nuclear weapons. So this is no longer a fledgling program. This is a big program. Right. This is a serious big program. And the point to make there is not just to say that it's grown, but while we need to focus on complete verifiable denuclearization as a goal, we have to be pragmatic about the fact that that is not happening anytime soon. That is going to take time. And in the interim, uh, what we need to focus on is trying to manage the growth of the program and reduce the threat that comes from that program, right? Now, critics will say, oh, so that means you're gonna buy the same horse for a fourth time, which is you know, to trade energy assistance in order to freeze the program. And, and I think almost certainly that will be one of the first steps in terms of doing this. Um, <clears throat> but you know, steps beyond that really have to be re realistic um, in terms of not simply saying at that point, well, you give up all your weapons and then we'll think about lifting sanctions, right? That's just not practical. 
people. It's just not, it's just not possible with a program as big as this. And so there needs to be focus on interim steps to try to create some sort of um, uh, threat reduction with regard to the, the program. Um, the third point, uh, I the third thing I think that, um, that folks are, have to think about is, is um, human rights, right? Um, uh, North Korea is one of the worst human rights violators in the history of the modern international relations. We don't fully understand the scope of North Korean human rights abuses because they have been uh, very much nameless and faceless. Uh, we know statistics, right, about the numbers of people that died in the famine or, or um, um, uh, the people in gulags, but very rarely can we put a name or a face to this, uh, which is exactly how the North Koreans would prefer it, uh, because then there isn't sort of a Lu Xiaobo or, uh, or, 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 or An San Suu Kyi that they can attach to uh, personify the problem. Um, but having said that, <laughs> um, the human rights piece of this is actually quite important to denuclearization. Um, the conventional wisdom is to think of these as two separate things and that when we're not talking to North Korea, we can bash them over the head on human rights but when we're, we're talking to North Korea, we can't bring it up because they take offense at it and it will be to the detriment of the more important nuclear negotiations. I would submit to you that that is not the best thinking on this. And that in fact, um, the US talking about human rights with North Korea is not something meant to sabotage negotiations with North Korea, but it's, it, it would be actually a symbol of how serious the United States is about negotiations with North Korea. And the reason I say that is because practically speaking, even if the United States wanted to provide um, economic assistance to North Korea in return for steps on denuclearization, um, it would be impossible for the United States to do that with the current human rights violations that are occurring in North Korea. In fact, US law prevents companies like Coca-Cola or one time the North Koreans wanted Coca-Cola and Kentucky Fried Chicken in North Korea, in, in, North, in their country. Don't ask me why those two things, but that was something that they had, they, they had wanted. Um, and, you know, today, even if the president were to say to Coca-Cola and Kentucky Fried Chicken, please go into North Korea, they could not because U.S. law prevents them because of human rights abuses in North Korea. So, the point of all this is to say is that human rights is integral to a political improvement of relations between the United States and North Korea, and it is integral to economic assistance from the United States to North Korea, and, and those things are important for denuclearization. So these two things are uh, much more closely interlinked, and they're not diametrically opposed to each other, as has often been th thought about. Um, the fourth thing I, that I would mention is... Um, the importance of allies in negotiating with North Korea. Um, um, dealing with North Korea's nuclear weapons problems is, are important, but for the United States, the most important equity that we have in Asia is our alliances. That is by far the most important equity. It connects to the North Korea problem. It connects to the China challenge. It connects to climate change, it connects to global health, it connects to everything. And so um, um, we should never be negotiating with North Korea over the heads or behind the backs of our allies. Um, and so um, um, what does that mean? It certainly means coordinating our strategies, coming up with common strategies. And I think that's why we've seen you know, uh, Tony Blinken going to Korea and Japan as his first trip, the national security advisors of Japan and Korea coming to meet with Jake Sullivan um, in Annapolis, um, um, uh, lots of efforts at coordinating. That's certainly important. What we don't want to do is be in a situation like we were um, in 2017, 2018, when um, the United States, in particular the U.S. president, uh, without telling anybody, 
said unilaterally that we are going to stop our military exercises with South Korea as a favor to the North Korean leader. Right? That would be an example of negotiating behind the backs and over the heads of our allies, um, which didn't achieve much in terms of denuclearization and decreased our readiness and capabilities uh, in the alliance on the peninsula, right? So that's not, that, that we want to avoid that. Two last points, Tom, before I'll turn it back to you. Um, um, there's a lot of debate over whether the United States should negotiate multilaterally or bilaterally with North Korea. Um, the agreed framework that the Clinton administration did was bilateral. The, the talks that I was involved in were multilateral, the six-party talks involving China um, and the United States, the two Koreas, Japan and Russia. And so there's always lots of discussion about you know, I mean, one was done by a Democratic administration, one was done by a Republican administration. So there's the political aspect of this, you know, which of these is better. Um, <clears throat> I would submit to you that that to me is a red herring, right? That in the end, there really isn't much of a difference between bilateral and multilateral talks. And that in fact, even in multilateral talks, there is a lot of bilateral negotiation that takes place between the US and, and North Korea. People always say, well, the North Koreans wanna to talk to you, meaning the United States. They don't really wanna to talk to anybody else. They wanna to talk to you. So why not make it bilateral? And the answer is that um, uh, the multilateral process does bring in more parties uh, to, to the negotiation. Um, it uh, is easier to coordinate views. Uh, and in the context of those bilateral meetings, you can still do a lot of, uh, in, in the context of those multilateral meetings, you can still do a lot of bilateral discussion um, with, uh, with, the, um, uh, with North Korea. Um, the final point is on China. Um, and here, um, I think as you're all well aware, we are in a, uh, in a, very different place with regard to China than where we were 10 years ago. Um, uh, there is a general consensus in Washington that the so-called responsible stakeholder experiment with China has concluded. Uh, the, you know, the notion of trying to bring China into um, the community of nations to support the liberal rules-based order from which they profited handsomely and economically grew tremendously uh, since Nixon's opening to China. There, I think, is a consensus in DC, at least, that that experiment has failed. Uh, that, uh, and part of that is, you know, uh, to be blamed on China in the sense that we have a different and much more assertive leadership in China. But part of it is also blamed on the United States that we thought that somehow if we engage China, that they would want to become more like us, right? Which they clearly do not want to do. Um, and so when this, this context for the North Korea problem certainly makes it more complicated in the sense that under the responsible stakeholder template, you know, there was a view often expressed by many that the United States and China share uh, similar interests on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, they would like to see no nuclear weapons on the Korean Peninsula, um, and that for this reason, there should be, they should be able to cooperate to try to bring North Korea to the table, to provide security assurances, to provide economic assistance, to get them to give up their, uh, uh, their weapons. And that even cooperation on this particular issue, pragmatic cooperation on North Korea, could become a platform for broader cooperation between the United States and China across a whole host of issues. Um, that, is not the, in, that is not the environment in which we're living today, right? Um, the environment in which we're living today is that, you know, there is this broad competition taking place by the, between the US and China. And if anything, uh, North Korea denuclearization provides maybe an island of cooperation between the United States and China. Not a platform for broader US-China cooperation, but an, but an island, a, a sort, of, sort of isolated island of cooperation. And even here on this island of cooperation, the overlap is tactical more than it is strategic. 
in the sense that um, you know, China doesn't want a crisis on the Korean Peninsula. They certainly don't want a war or a crisis on the peninsula. And when, when push comes to shove, they will do what they can to ensure that crisis won't happen. But at the same time, they, want, um, to, they don't want North Korea to collapse. Um, and they are ambivalent, agnostic about complete denuclearization. They'd like to see threat reduction, but they don't necessarily have to see complete uh, denuclearization because they don't see a threat from those weapons. Um, and of course, that is not the strategic, that does not strategically overlap with the United States. I would say the United States would like to see a nuclear free Korean Peninsula and would like to see a unified Korean Peninsula uh, whole and free. Um, so there is no strategic overlap between the two, but there is a perhaps small tactical overlap which is a much more limited basis for cooperation between, uh, between the United States and China. Um, so to conclude, it, you know, this, this issue, um, it, you know, the North Korea is known as the land of lousy options, uh, which means when we are making policy on North Korea, we are not choosing between good and great options. We are choosing between bad and worse options. Um, and, uh, and that, you know, that land of lousy options has only become harder uh, over the past four years. Um, and so the challenges are really very clear for the administration. Uh, like I said, I think they have great people who are uh, going to try to deal with this. But I can also say, frankly, I feel sorry for the person who's got to take on this job, right? The, the, the job of doing this, because it, it will not it will not be easy. Um, again, the choices are between bad and lousy options, but at the same time, it's extremely important because um, uh, this program can be a source of tremendous instability in one of the most prosperous and growing regions of the world, which would have global implications. So with that, um, Tom, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you again, LMU, for the chance to be with you today, and I look forward to the discussion. Well, Professor Shaw, that was uh, fabulous. I took a lot of notes. Um, and uh, let me know when the, the quiz that is coming. Uh, the, I, I have many questions, but we have a, a very nice size uh, or Zoom audience who, who will have questions. And I encourage that all of the student participants and, uh, and so on, older than that participants to please post your questions in the Q&A. Since we don't have a lot of time left, uh, I will um, confine myself, uh, which is not easy, uh, to, uh, <laughs> to uh, asking you uh, about uh, uh, Korea itself as a totality is in a very tough neighborhood. Uh, there are a lot of easier places it could be situated. Uh, you've got Russia, you've got China, uh, you've got North South Korea, and of course, you have this country called Japan, which has a serious interest in, um, in this issue, and of course, about which you are very knowledgeable. Uh, my question is, is, and I'm going to put it in a simplistic way, and emphasize the journalistic dimension of my DNA. So I'll put it in a simplistic way. A scholarly way, we would do it a different way, and it would, but it would take longer. Right, but, exactly. <laughs> and, in, and further studies would be necessary. But, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but, but if you could choose, if Victor Cha could choose and said, look, I want to get, I really do want to get um, denuclearization moving in the right direction or Korea, this is in everybody's interest. I don't care what anyone else says. I know this to be true and so on and so forth. In Seoul, in South Korea, if you, you, if you were God and you wanted to give those two ladies a better answer than you were able to give those two ladies, which is that in my lifetime, you want this done in, in your lifetime, would you say it would be better to have a hawk as president of South Korea or a sunshine policy type president as the head of South Korea? Yeah, you know, I've, that, that's, uh, I've never gotten that question before, Tom. You know, <laughs> that's probably, a very... Probably because it's a dumb question, you know. <laughs> no, it's a very, it's, it's a very interesting question because, you know, um, it's interesting because if we did it based on the history, 
you know, neither of them have been particularly successful. Um, progressive presidents, or doves, as you say, have certainly made progress in terms of inter-Korean relations, right? The Kaesong Industrial Complex, the Diamond Mountain Tourism Project. But at the same time, those things have all been walked back. And they've not been walked back only, uh, they've been walked back by North Korea, but they've, and they've not been walked back only when you had a, concern, a hawkish government in South Korea, right? They've been walked back when you've had a dovish government in South Korea. You know, most recently, the blow, you know, they blew up the inter-Korean liaison office that the South Koreans built, you know, during Moon Jae-in's presidency, like a big, expensive, like, I don't know, $2 billion, you know, glassy building that they built that was just destroyed by the North Koreans. I mean, you know, so, um, so I, so I guess the way I would answer that is to say, I don't know how much that matters in terms of inter-Korean reconciliation. Um, um, uh, you might have marginally more progress with doves than with hawks, um, but, but in the end, you know, what does seem to make the difference is the US DPRK piece of this, the US North Korea piece of this. And, um, and what progress is made there. Whether the North Koreans are talking to a dovish government or a hawkish government in South Korea, they always say one thing, which is, you know, we want to talk to the Americans about denuclearization and we'll think about any assistance you want to give us. We'll think about it. We, we may take it, we might not take it. And if we take it, you should be grateful, right? You should be grateful that we, that we took it, right? The Moon government is trying to give them assistance right now. And the North Koreans are saying, no, thank you, you know, uh, but if we take it, you should be grateful that we're doing you a favor, right? So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of, I'm not, I don't want to say it doesn't matter because clearly there are different sort of uh, dynamics when you have a dovish or a hawkish government in Korea. Uh, but in, in terms of inter-Korean reconciliation, neither have been uh, very successful in that regard. All right. Well, one more question in, in that context, and then we're going to weave in. Well, we better go to it right away. I've taken up enough of our overall time. Uh, this is an interesting question. I, I'm not sure it can be uh, completely understood the way it's written, but it's a very intelligent question. So I'm just going to put it out there and let you do, do with it what you want. Uh, from Anatoly, the, the question goes, China and to a lesser extent Russia, are major foreign nations having a stake and influence over North Korea and denuclearization? What political, economic, and military steps on the part of the U.S. on the part of the U.S. do you envision towards these nations in the context of the goal of North Korea denuclearization? Right. Okay. Um, so thanks for the question, Anatoly. So I. Um, um, I kind of addressed the China piece of this already. So let me address the Russia piece um, in the interest of time. Um, and so here, what I'd say is that um, Russia, um, I, you know, Russia's interests in this issue and on the Korean Peninsula have been remarkably consistent over time, right? In the sense that they are largely focused on commercial and economic interests on the peninsula related to energy infrastructure and transport infrastructure, all of which that would connect the Korean Peninsula or reconnect the Korean Peninsula to the Russian Far East and thereby giving them access to uh, Northeast Asia, right? That, you know, that has historically been Russia's interest and it continues to be Russia's interest. And, and so in that sense, they, I think they look at the North Korea problem almost entirely through that lens. So for example, when we were doing talks with the North Koreans, uh, the Russian delegation was very, was, you know, they would go along with denuclearization, but they were very focused on one thing, which was energy assistance, providing uh, light water reactor technology to North Korea, tra rail transport infrastructure, things actually that the moon government, the current South Korean government are very interested in too. So. So they've been remarkably consistent in the way they approach these sorts of things. And, and you know, and they could be helpful in, in a time and place when, when um, that sort of cooperation is on the table for discussion and for negotiation, um, that, you know, th they may, they may play a very, uh, may play a very useful role. 
Uh, another qu question, this one from Sam. Uh, I've never, I have never seen before, I'm sure you have, if it's been seenable, you've seen it. Uh, but I'm gonna lay it out here for us. Do you, sir, have any idea of where the nuclear weapons will go if North Korea agrees to become denuclearized? How will they be dealt with? And in a sense, uh, but if you don't know, that is fine also. <laughs> a friendly um, <laughs> so, uh, um, um, so I, you know, I think that um, what we do know is that this won't be like Libya, right? In the sense that there will be components of a nuclear weapons program that will then be created up, you know, hauled out to the airport, created up and taken to national labs, right? In the United States. The, the program is just too big. Right? We don't know where all of it is. The Chinese don't know where all of it is. The Russians don't know where all of it is. You know, nobody knows where all of this is. I mean, North Korea has, you know, an extensive underground network, you know, burrowed deep under mountains of, of stuff that you can't see from the sky. And it's just very, very difficult to imagine that it would be as neat and as clean um, as Libya. So it will be a major project that will probably require regional support, you know, including the Chinese and the Russians and others, um, 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 you know, um, uh, and, and so I think that's, you know, that's the first answer to the question. The second is that, um, the, you know, I don't think anybody, uh, including South Korea, will, will or will want to inherit North Korea's nuclear weapons, right? Um, and so I think those would be, um, you know, dealt with um, by some combination of, of the three nuclear states, right? The United States, Russia, and, and, and China. Um, but I don't think um, they're going to be left there for somebody to just pick up on the way home, you know, <laughs> on the way home from school. <laughs> I still hope not. Um, the... Um... One thing that is not addressed in your comments, probably because just of the short amount of time you have, is um, that the uh, is the role of the United States in the sense of whether, when you add it all up, whether on the one hand we are the one that North Korea wants to dance with because we have the resources to to, to do the deal, but on the other hand, if you look at the policies of the last several administrations in the U.S., which include regime change and the emphasis on regime change, uh, that would be, would create some difficulties for the regime in the North if it wished, wished not to be changed. And therefore, the question really is, is can you um, uh, uh, really say to the North Koreans that, you know, you won't become Gaddafi? Uh, you know the famous memo that the North Koreans sent saying that we, we, we feel that if we, if we didn't have nuclear weapons, we'd be Gaddafi. Uh, and if Gaddafi had nuclear weapons, he'd still be in power. I mean, how do you honestly answer that? I mean, it's, I think that's a good point. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I think it's a fair point. And, and I can tell you, and, and um, this, was in my, my, this was in my book as well that I wrote a few years ago about North Korea. And it's and that book went through um, um, that it went through a clearance process at my old office, so I can share this. I mean, there was a point in our talks with North Korea, um, you know, and, and we were remember we were as you know well, Tom, we were talking to North Korea in the in the context of having invaded two countries, right? We had invaded Afghanistan, and we had invaded Iraq, and uh, the North Koreans at one point in sort of not in the formal talks, but when we were sort of talking on the side, you know, got very, you know, they, they, they're professional diplomats. They're very professional and they're, you know, they, and it's mostly they're America people who work in negotiations. So they speak English and, and, and you know, and that, at that time they're asking questions about like, you know, do you think Hillary Clinton would actually be a candidate for president? Like they ask questions. But at one point they got quite animated and quite serious when we were talking about denuclearization. And they said, look, um, you invaded two countries, right? Um, <clears throat> um, you invaded Afghanistan because they didn't, have not, they didn't have nuclear weapons and you invaded Iraq because they didn't have nuclear weapons. 
we have nuclear weapons. You will never invade us, right? Um, and so that was one of those moments in negotiations where, uh, you know, and that clearly wasn't in their instructions to say that, but it became crystal clear how they thought about this issue, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think the, the only answer I can give there is that, um, and, and this was something that every president has tried to do, even Trump tried to do this personally with the North Korean leader is to try to change that calculation by, by changing the way they think about security and by trying to draw a picture for them of what, a, what the environment would look like for North Korea without nuclear weapons, right? And so, you know, in Trump's case, he, you know, he gave visions of casinos and beachfront condos Right, where North Korea fires artillery off the off the off the um, east coast of the island. I guess that's one way of trying to do it, but the other way we tried to do it was um, we we create we talked about creating something called the Northeast Asian Peace and Security Mechanism, that was essentially the notion of common security that North Korea could live in an environment where nobody would threaten its borders, nobody would threaten it. Um, in terms of their national security, and that all countries would attest to that, right, through this Northeast Asian peace and security mechanism. So, um, so the idea was to try to change the way they thought about, if I don't have weapons, I'm going to end up like Gaddafi, to trying to think about, if I give up these weapons, I will, you know, enrich the country, I will be connected to the most economically vibrant place in the world, um, uh, and I will have external security, right? The rub or the most difficult part of that is that the regime may care about all those things, but the thing it cares about the most is not external security. The thing it cares about the most is security of the leadership and of the family. Right? Right. And it's hard for anybody to guarantee that, right? It's hard for the United States to guarantee that level of security. We can guarantee external security, but we can't guarantee regime security. Uh, Victor, I think we unfortunately uh, run, uh, come to the end of our allotted time. Is that correct, Dr. Peck, or uh, do we have... Uh, Tom, you can entertain probably one more question. All right. This this question is a humdinger. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think we should end on a humdinger. And as I say, if I, the, scholar, the, the, the professor part of me would not ask this question, uh, but the journalistic part of me will. And it comes from someone who is named Anonymous Attendee. Okay. So, okay. Okay. Are, ready. Okay. <laughs> are certain <laughs> South Korean government officials in Moon's regime, quote, pro North Korea, as some people are concerned? <laughs> <laughs> well, first, first time, I want to thank you for using the adjective humdinger, because I think <laughs> it educates sort of the younger people in the audience about, <laughs> about. <laughs> Yeah, about the sort of vocabulary we used to use and old in, people uh, use. <laughs> yeah, that old people use yeah but it's a <laughs> it's a it's a great term and so um and so the answer to that question is you know i know that you know from a journalistic or or more from a social media perspective you know that's sometimes the way the moon government is referred to um because they seem to advocate a lot for north korea despite the fact that north korea has been terribly uncooperative um, you know, they haven't answered any of the Biden administration's efforts to be in touch with them. Instead, they're just firing missiles, things of that nature. But I would say that the, that, it, and, and so it, when, if you sort of do that, then you kind of sound like you're North Korea's lawyer, right? The moon government kind of sounds like they're North Korea's lawyer. But I would say that while that's one way to look at it, where, where I think part of that comes from is a deeply held ideology, um, uh, you know, of progressives in South Korea. And, and just like for Americans, we believe in democracy and freedom. We believe in those things. It's our ideology. We believe in those things. For many progressives in South Korea, there's a deeply held view that all of the difficulties that the Korean nation faces, whether it's economic difficulties, social difficulties, security difficulties, in the end, at their core, derive from the external division of the country, right? The division of the country was externally imposed. Right? And so um, as long as they believe that, they believe that the priority above everything else is inter-Korean reconciliation, right? And so you can criticize that, and I have criticized that, 
right? Um, myself, I mean, but at the same time, you can understand where they're coming from, right? You can understand that particular viewpoint. Um, and it's cloaked in nationalism and patriotism that, that in the end, that is the source of the problem. And if there is no longer division, you know, this takes us back to your, your, your opening story time. If there's no division, then um, many of Korea's problems will be, will be solved. And you're done. Okay. <laughs> um, thanks, Tom. Uh, thank you. I'm moderating the intriguing conversation with Dr. Cha. And Dr. Cha, thank you so much for talking to LMD community out of your very busy schedule. Uh, we really appreciate your comprehensive and insightful analysis of denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. I have one question. I cannot go to bed without asking this question. So if you do not mind, I'd like to use my prerogative as an organizer of this webinar. The most interesting point that I heard from you today was we have to link human rights issues to this denuclearization of Korean Peninsula. I listened to many experts, but I think that you are the first one that uh, actually that, that uh, who raised that issue. Um, as you know, for past uh, four years or so, this uh, the current the Korean the government um, they seem to continue to ignore that the human rights in, uh, issue in North Korea. So, presidential election is coming up about a year after. How important do you think that, that there has to be some kind of change in the South Korean government stance with regard to the issue, a human rights issue in North Korea? And some people even say that, that you know, this North Korean refugee issue has been sort of what uh, either distorted or um, they have not been given a whole lot of attention. So I'm just curious about uh, um, because is that a part of the new approach that with the launch of that, uh, you know, this uh, uh, Biden administration? And how much do you think that, that this will leverage that uh, the negotiation in the future? Well, thank you uh, for the question, Professor Peck. You know, I, it is an important issue. I mean, un, undeniably, it's an important issue. And I think Many Koreans feel it, it's, a, it's an important issue. The, um, um, there have been um, some pretty difficult policies the Moon government has undertaken with regard to South Korean citizens, right, um, who want to tr try to bring more information and things um, in, in, into North Korea. The Biden administration has made very clear that they focus on uh, democracy and human rights, right? They've been very outspoken on Hong Kong, on Xinjiang, on Burma. Um, and, um, and it's a little bit more delicate, I think, with South Korea. And so I think there hasn't been a lot of public discussion of this, but I would imagine privately, you know, there's some concern about when there's passage of laws that restrict South Korean citizens' ability to, to want to try to send information into North Korea, um, whether it's successful or not. Um, and so, um, so I imagine there are private conversations taking place like that, um, not, not public. And um, that, you know, look, in the end, w w if we put this in a broader context, you know, what all of these countries have in common is a desire to maintain a rules-based international order based on freedom and democracy, which in some cases is being challenged by another big country in the international system. And so, um, you know, I, my view is that South Korea should be part of that group that wants to maintain that liberal rules-based order. And if they're going to practice that globally, they have to practice it at home. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. So I would like to thank all of you who joined the webinar today. I hope that you have enjoyed the program. We'll be back with another program in four.